and now the person who imparts knowledge to the crucial people who run this Ramakrishna mission, uh, Principal Swami Sarupiyananda is going to talk to us about Swami Vivekananda's philosophy of education. Very good afternoon to all of you, respected uh, Professor Shankarshati Bhattacharya, revered monks, revered Matajis, and a very distinguished audience here uh, of uh, participants and observers. It's a pleasure and a privilege, as always, to be here at the Institute of Culture and to speak about Swami Vivekananda's philosophy of education. Especially, I'll, I'll emphasize the word philosophy because uh, this program, this whole seminar, is being backed by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. So, this presentation will be not just about Swami Vivekananda's thoughts on education, but on, will take a philosophical angle. Now, to begin with, was Swami Vivekananda a philosopher of education? Was he a philosopher at all? This is an interesting question. And to answer this, I'll reply in Schopenhauer's words. Schopenhauer, um, at the beginning of his, I think his masterpiece, the word is will and idea. Uh, he says that there are two kinds of philosophers. There are the real philosophers and there are the academic philosophers. And the distinction he makes is this way. The real philosopher, the genuine philosopher is puzzled by life. And the academic philosopher is puzzled by his books. So, so, so with all the problems an academic philosopher works on, he finds in his books. Whereas uh, when you confront life and if you are puzzled by life and you start philosophically thinking about the problems thrown up by life, then you are a philosopher. In that sense, Swami Vivekananda certainly was a philosopher. And he was also a philosopher of education because he thought about education a lot and education was central to his thought. This quotation itself, oft quoted, uh, which Professor Bhatta also uh, quoted in part, so from a letter to Sharola Ghoshal, editor of Bharati, was a very educated lady, and he writes, education, education, education alone, traveling through many cities of Europe and, this, and observing in them comforts and education of even the poor people, we brought to my mind the state of our own poor people, and I used to shed tears. What made the difference? Education was the answer I got. Now, why was Swami Vivekananda interested in education? He was a monk. Uh, spirituality was his central concern. I was thinking about this just yesterday, before going into his education, I thought, why did he talk about education at all? And so much of emphasis on education. And I found three reasons. There may be more, of course. Uh, three reasons which, which come to mind are these. Okay. First is, of course, the practical reason, the uplift of the masses, the problems he observed in Indian society, the suffering of, uh, of the masses, the condition of women. One uh, prescription, major prescription for alleviating the condition of women, he said, was education. Somebody asked him about widow remarriage. That was the burning question, social reform question in those days. And uh, what position do you take? And Swami Vivekananda said, that, uh, am I a widow that you are asking me that? Uh, educate the women and they will solve their own problems. So education for women also, that was uh, his point. Uh, the youth losing faith in their culture. And he said the proper education is necessary for the youth. So a practical reason. The second reason is very interesting. Education is preparation for spirituality. I will draw your attention to the quotation which I gave little while ago. We usually stop here. Most of the times I've seen this being quoted, they stop at this point. Education was the answer I got. But if you look at the next sentence, through education comes faith in one's own self, and through faith in one's own self, the inherent Brahman is waking up. And it goes on to say, in their case, the Brahman is waking up in the Western uh, societies. In our country, the Brahman, our inherent Brahman has become dormant, gone to sleep. And then he gives a uh, rather evocative story about Irish immigrants coming to the United States at that time, they were migrating in large numbers because of their famine in Ireland. And he says how they come beaten, cowering, uh, despairing, and they land in New York, and then people tell them, Pat, you are as much a man as I am, and within a few days, this man is standing straight looking at you in the eye, and he is working to make his life a success. And he says this comes from, uh, education will give this kind of confidence to people. When they become aware of their own possibilities, 
and they start manifesting those possibilities, they see what a change it can make to their lives, they actually are ready for spirituality. See the connection he makes between education and spirituality there. So, I'm making this claim. He thought of education as a preparation for spirituality. For those who are highly cultured and highly educated, that's all right. But for the vast majority of mankind, especially of Indians in those days, even today, it is, um, as Sri Ramakrishna put it in a more homely way, Khalibete Dharmohaya. So, first, education, then leading to dharma or spirituality. And the last point, an even deeper and a more philosophical point, education as spirituality, and this requires some explanation. Swami Vivekananda once said that, uh, he was asked, did Shankara, pre uh, Hinduism, does it preach that the one alone is real and the many are false? And Swami Vivekananda said that yes, that um, you know Hinduism preaches, Shankara preached that one alone is real and the world is meant world of many is false. Buddhism preached that the world of many is continuously changing, anitta, and there is no one ultimate reality. And what Sri Ramakrishna and I have come to show is that the one and the many are the same reality, appearing to different people at different levels of spiritual development. And his theory about Dvaita, Dvaita, Vishishta, Dvaita, and these different stages. Now, Sister Nivedita gives a sort of commentary on this in her remarkable introduction to the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. She says there, if you want to understand Swami Vivekananda, and here I am reminded of Professor Mukhopad, they were saying, to understand Vivekananda, we must go outside Vivekananda, see where lies the roots of Vivekananda. And Sister Nivedita says there are three in number. One is the Guru. Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Second is the spiritual knowledge of India, the Shastras, the Vedanta. And third is India itself. So these three, the nation, the uh, spirituality, the religion and Guru, these three are the sources of Vivekananda. And there she makes a point that the great contribution of our master, she says the most significant contribution of Vivekananda is this, that the one and the many are the same reality. She makes this point there. And then she says, what are the implications? No difference henceforth between sacred and secular. To labor is to pray. Maharaj quoted in the morning, that to labor is to pray. Uh, the factory and, um, and the shop and uh, you know, all places where people work, these are as fit a meeting place between man and God as the monks sell on the doors of a temple. If that is so, then Nivedita herself says, science and religion, and science itself becomes uh, a path to spiritual realization. Science becomes a path to spiritual realization. She points it out there. It's not only that they are not contradictory, not only that they uh, are in harmony, but actually you can do science and spiritual practice. And I am reminded of a monk, one of our monks, a mathematician, who was awarded the Bhatnagar Award for uh, Pure Mathematics last year, who is in our university, Mohan Maharaj. Now, it's a very interesting thing, a monk doing pure science, I think the first time a, um, a sannyasi has been awarded uh, a major award, science award for doing cutting edge work in pure science. An interesting thing is, if uh, in the reporter asked him, what is the connection, you are a sadhu and you are doing <coughs> mathematics, and his reply was very interesting. He said, there is no, uh, no conflict, it is my spiritual practice. How could he say that? He said that because of Vivekananda. These are the implications of education in relation to Swamiji's thoughts on spirituality. Now, when we speak about um, the philosophy of education, we talk about the philosophy of education in five parameters. Uh, in B.A. courses, when you teach the philosophy of education, you normally will talk about uh, the philosopher, what he has to say about the aim of education, the method of education, curriculum, role of the teacher and discipline. First is aim of education. What is the purpose of education? Whether it's Rousseau or Vivekananda or Tagore or anybody, Bertrand Russell, you ask what is the aim of education according to this thinker? Second, what special unique methodology of education does he provide? How to teach? Which you see in Pan Panchatran to the storytelling method, the methodology. Third, what is to be taught? Fourth, what is the role of the teacher in this scheme? Fifth, he used to talk about discipline, but I saw a new book on the philosophy of education published a few years back. Just a day before yesterday I was leafing through it, I find there are about four parameters. Discipline is no longer in vogue. 
So they have dropped it. So there are four parameters now, aim of education, method of education, curriculum and role of the teacher. Let's quickly go through Swamiji's ideas. There is a descriptive way of doing it. Collecting Swamiji's thoughts and classifying them in this way. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick up one or two of his thoughts in each category and do a little bit of philosophizing on that. First, well-known definition, education is a manifestation of the perfection already in man. This is uh, often quoted and I think uh, children, especially in Ramakrishna mission schools, they memorize it and they get two marks in the examination. They write, education is a manifestation of the perfection already in man. And I cannot resist telling you, one of our monks who is uh, a bit of a wit, he was uh, called for giving a talk and he invited out some other monks also. Uh, I mean, lecture the Vatamara Goshet Shunbe. And he said, education is the manifestation of uh, perfection. After the lecture, he asked one of the monks, Come on, Bulam, how did I, uh, what, how, how did you like my talk? Yeah, Bula, I said, there's some mistake. What mistake? You left out already in man. And immediately he said, I did already in man, so I don't care. But I'm going to uh, pursue that point. Let's do a little bit of thinking about this. Education is a manifestation of the perfection already in man. You're going back to Plato. Somebody said that, uh, um, I think Bertrand Russell, a man can tell us, Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Whitehead, 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 Whitehead. yes, it was, uh, Whitehead. Famously said that Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. And uh, I was reading the encyclopedia of uh, philosophy of education, so that we can say as much for the philosophy of education, not just for philosophy, but philosophy of education also is a series of footnotes to Plato. Mm -hmm. His master work in the Republic is a long dialogue. And there, at the end, he says this. If I am right, then certain professors of education must be wrong when they say they can put a knowledge in the, in the soul which was not there before, like sight into blind eyes. Whereas our argument, that is his argument, is that it shows that the power and capacity of learning exists in the soul already. And it is not controversial. What he said, Plato said at that time, Swami Vivekananda said it. Chomsky also is saying in, in a more limited uh, context. Uh, yes, language. Generative drama. Now, basically the contrast is this. Generally idealistic thought uh, education is that you pour education into uh, a, a reserve, an empty container. Tabula rasa, Locke said is a blank slate and uh, knowledge is to be poured, a kind of pipeline theory of teaching, where you pour knowledge into somebody. And here, Swamiji, Plato and a number of other thinkers, they are saying that um, it depends to a great deal on the person who is learning. It's not a one-way process. Now, this is not new, but what is new is this. Okay, to make this more clear, Plato gives the allegory of the cave, the famous allegory of the cave, I found this cartoon. It's not very accurate, anyhow. The idea is, most people, we are <coughs> ignorance, and Plato says that we are like people in a cave, we are trapped. Trapped means we are securely bound, we can only look forward. We cannot turn around. Behind us are the real objects, here. And behind them, there is a fire burning, and it throws shadows on the wall of the cave. And what we see are the shadows of the reality. So what we fall, or what we see are the shadows of reality, the real what you would call the perfect, the forms of uh, Plato, Platonic forms, those we don't see. Now, if a teacher comes, an enlightened person comes, he sets us free and he persuades us to, and he says, holds him by the hand and takes him out into the sunlit lands, where he is at first blinded, then he is able to see the reality. Then he has to come back and free the other people, and it takes some struggle. And he says, this, this kind of, this is teaching, this is a model of teaching, and this is the person who is fit to rule also. And he goes on. Now, this was the model of idealistic thought in the philosophy of education. Now I am jumping to a critique. It is still a footnote, footnote to Plato. Are we for Plato or against Plato? But still a footnote to Plato. The new education in the United States traces its roots to John Dewey. And John Dewey interestingly traces his philosophical roots to William James and Charles Pierce in pragmatism. And William James was pretty close to Swami Vivekananda also. Um, 
probably they influenced each other in some ways. And his criticism is uh, threefold. First, he is dead set against any kind of preset, you know, a priori ultimate reality already set and the teacher will take you there. He does not like that idea at all. We are biological organisms moving towards something, uh, evolving, changing and moving in through action. Not that there is a fit, there is already a set ideal which some people know and they have to take us there, not that way. Second, Plato had no perception of the uniqueness of individuals. They fall by nature into classes, which masks the infinite diversity of active tendencies. Third, he says, this is not Plato, this is what he says, teacher has the task of guiding and facilitating the growth of students who are growing organisms. And he is not supposed to impose a fixed end upon the process, which Plato seems to say. Now, why I am saying all this is this. Here is what I, I am putting together, all of it together. See, Swami Vivekananda here shares the insight of Plato, but the educational program he puts forward perhaps takes care of Dewey's objections. Plato talks about moving educational process, moving you from illusion to reality. We are you know, seeing falsity, we have to go to reality. And in one sense, Shankara also does that. The whole program is to move from uh, the world of Maya to the world of reality. And uh, that's done through knowledge. So in Shankara's program is a, basically a pedagogical pro program. It's, it's a program of teaching actually. And then Plato's approach is an insight approach where you use, actually literally use the terminology of seeing, I see. Whereas Dewey says I act should be the uh, methodology of education, not I see, not I understand. It should be, I assimilate through action and, uh, and, and interaction with the environment. And teacher imparts knowledge. Whereas, if you look at Swami Vivekananda's program, he does not say, we move from illusion to reality. He replaces it from illusion to reality, from lower truth to higher truth. Swamiji always say this, we always move from lower truth to higher truth. From a lesser appreciation of reality to a better appreciation of reality. And even for practical terms, you know, he writes to his countrymen, you have done well, but you must do better now. It's not that what you have done so far is wrong and we must change and come do something right. And then he says, education, if you look at the definition, is the manifestation of the perfection already in us. Look at the word manifestation. It's not understanding. It is a kind of manifestation and manifestation takes place through action, through life through living. And then um, the teacher facilitates. In Swami Vivekananda's theory of education, the teacher is the role of a facilitator, which Dewey wanted, and Swami Vivekananda definitely recognizes the uniqueness of individuals. <coughs> Swami Vivekananda says in one place, uh, follow your own highest goal, that is the quickest road to progress. Each must grow according to his own nature. The uniqueness. Okay. From there, so that's one point I've covered, the aim of education, manifestation of the perfection already in, in us. Uh, if that is the goal, if that is the aim, then what role does a teacher have to play here? Uh, this is uh, something that I want to consider briefly. Swamiji says, the only duty of the teacher is to remove all obstructions from the way. And uh, he says that the innate perfection of the student has to be manifested. He gives the gardener example. Gardener and the plant. So the gardener does not force the plant to grow. The gardener only creates the conditions for the plant to grow and the plant grows according to its own nature. Swamiji also insisted that the teacher must have a character like a blazing fire and should be an embodiment of the highest teaching. Okay. Role of the teacher is facilitating, according to Swami Vivekananda. And facilitating literally means making easy in Latin. That which is difficult for the student is made easy. And uh, this analogy, I'm grateful to Dr. Karajagi, Guru Raj Karajagi, who talked about this uh, last year in a seminar in Mulpar. He said, in a vehicle you have five wheels actually. We are we see the four wheels of a vehicle which move and the car is moving. And we often miss the steering wheel. There is a fifth wheel and the fifth wheel function is not like the functions of the other four wheels. 
In fact, it would be disastrous if the fifth wheel tried to take the load of the car and tried to roll as fast as the car is moving. Rather, the fifth wheel has to guide the motions of the other four wheels. And he says, unfortunately, what the teacher has been doing in our classrooms so far, in spite of all the modern <coughs> methods taught in weird classrooms, or not taught, but what the, basically what happens finally when the teacher goes to the classroom is, he acts like a, one of those four wheels. He uh, tries to force information into the student, he reads out the lesson, and the whole time is spent in trying to uh, throw knowledge at the student and manage the class instead of trying to uh, get out of the way of the students learning. Just shape and provide a channel for the students to grow and learn. And this is a famous example, Rousseau, who maybe is the father of modern education, educational thought. He wrote this book, Emil, where a boy is uh, the teacher, he goes as a teacher to a boy and instead of the traditional pedagogy, he, what he does is um, he creates an entirely new methodology of teaching the child and the basic idea is to awaken the curiosity of the child. Uh, he takes him, instead of teaching about geography and the directions, he takes him on a long walk into the forest and it's evening, the boy is scared, we must go back home now and the teacher says, I will not help you, you tell us how to go back home. So which way is home? And then he starts teaching about directions, about the stars and how you can calculate the directions by looking at the stars. And this way, an actual problem which the child faces and the solution comes through knowledge. So this, this kind of awakens the curiosity of the student and student learns much more effectively. Swami Vivekananda says, my education, idea of education is personal contact with the teacher, Guru Grihavasa, but I, I want you to Note, it, note this uh, phrase, personal contact with the teacher. Um, I'll just quickly mention this. One of the best, uh, well, most well-known educational thinkers of 20th century was the Russian, Vygotsky. Um, he is well-known for his social constructivism, with an important theory of, uh, in education. And he said interpersonal processes are very important in learning. And he developed this theory of ZPD. Sounds very sophisticated, but it's very simple actually. Zone of proximal, proximal development. What he says is this. How a teacher works. He says, a student always has this kind of a uh, situation. He knows this is what I can do by myself. How much I can read, how much I can understand, what problems I can solve. There are some things which I can do with help. With the help of a teacher or a senior student some problems I can solve, something I can do. And there is something that I cannot do. And what the teacher does is, he should help the student to make the transition from this, across this phase. This is called the zone of proximal development. This already the student has achieved. This is beyond his capacity now. Now student, the teacher has to guide him through this zone. And this, is, this teacher is called the significant other. It's by con contact with the significant other. It may be a teacher, maybe a mother, Maybe anybody comes close to the student and helps the student to transit this phase, zone of proximal development. So these are the learned tasks, and there's an interaction, and it helps the student to grow. Actually, this area expands, becomes bigger and bigger. And this is where I find Swami Vivekananda's idea of the teacher removing the obstacles from the, um, removing the obstacles from the student's path and also the personal contact and interaction with the teacher which Swami Vivekananda mentioned. This is a zone of proximal development. What is known and what is not known in between is a zone of proximal development and the uh, teacher helps guidance and encouragement from a knowledgeable person helps in making the transition. In uh, teacher training colleges they talk about the golden rule of teaching from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the unfamiliar from what is near to what, what is far and from what is to what shall be. So transition should be in this direction, not in the other direction. It's very interesting to note how this word, the technical word, pedagogy, how it evolved. The source is very interesting. The source is the Greek. Pace means child, agogos means a leader. And pedagogos actually was somebody who would take a line of children to the school, would guide the children to the school, physically. And usually it was a slave. So a pedagogue was a slave 
which many school teachers today can relate to, I think. They can now begin to, they, now, nowadays they feel that we are uh, slaves of the children. Uh, once a uh, uh, politician, a, a minister, he came to our college and he was joking. He said that uh, uh, when, uh, in our time when the student was seen in the principal's room, we knew the student was in trouble. Now when the student is seen in the principal's room, we know the principal is in trouble. <laughs> Now, this thing evolved. This thing evolved from the Greek to the uh, Latin, the Roman pedagogus, which meant supervisor of children. So, it, the person who was leading the children became a trainer of children. And then he became a teacher, from a trainer to a teacher, pedagogue, the French, from which the pedagogy, the word has come. But now, what Swami Vivekananda is saying, to go back to the original sense, when, that is leading or guiding, not physically leading or guiding, but as teaching, leading or guiding, and maybe a return to the original sense of the word pedagogy. At this stage, I think to break the monotony, I'll just take a few minutes to demonstrate what I mean, that uh, instead of pouring knowledge into a person, how a person can learn by oneself. A beautiful experiment was conducted by Shugato Mitro, where he showed the power of curiosity, how children can learn by themselves. This corner of the world. So if you think of a map of your country, I think you realize that in 1999, to try and address this problem with an experiment, which was a very simple experiment in New Delhi, I uh, basically embedded a computer into a wall of a slum in New Delhi. Uh, the children barely went to school, they didn't know any English, they'd never seen a computer before, and uh, they didn't know what the internet was. I connected high-speed internet to it, it's about three feet off the ground, turned it on and left it there. After this, we noticed a couple of interesting things which you'll see, but I repeated this all over India, and then through a large part of the world, and notice that children will learn to do what they want to learn to do. This is the first experiment that we did. Eight-year-old boy on your right, teaching his student, a six-year-old girl, and he was teaching her how to browse. This boy here in the middle of central India, this is a Rajasthan village, where the children recorded their own music and then played it back to each other and in the process they enjoyed themselves thoroughly. They did all of this in four hours after seeing the computer for the first time. In another South Indian village, these uh, boys here had assembled a video camera and were trying to take the photograph of a bumblebee. They had downloaded it from Disney.com or one of these websites, 14 days after putting the computer in their village. So at the end of it, we concluded that groups of children can learn to use computers and the internet on their own, irrespective of who or where they were. At that point, I became a little more ambitious and decided to see what else could children do with a computer. We started off with an experiment in Hyderabad, India, where I gave a group of children, they spoke English with a very strong Telugu accent. I gave them a computer with a speech-to-text interface, which you now get free with Windows, and uh, asked them to speak into it. So when they spoke into it, uh, the computer typed out gibberish. So they said, oh, it doesn't understand anything of what we are saying. So I said, yeah, I'll leave it here for two months. Make yourself understood to the computer. So the children said, how do we do that? And I said, uh, well, I don't know, actually. And I, <laughs> and I left. Two months later, and this is now documented in the uh, Information Technology for International Development Journal, their accents had changed and were remarkably close to the neutral British accent in which I had trained the speech-to-text synthesizer. In other words, they were all speaking like James Tooley. So, <laughs> so, so you can, uh, they could do that on their own. Okay, that goes on. But the uh, point which I want to make is, uh, 
that children can learn on their own. And so something more remarkable there also. The teacher's objective is this is just random learning. How will they do on examinations? And he gave a course on a computer and left it there for children who had not learned, a biology course. And after six months, he put a standard examination which is given in the schools to these children and they passed it. They actually passed the examination. Now, I'm not saying this is an illustration of Swami Vivekananda's philosophy of education because here the teacher is done away with. And they asked an educationist, is this good to the teacher be done away with? And the educationist replied very nicely, the teacher who can be done away with must be done away with. <laughs> If it's not contributing anything significant, it should be done away with. But my point here is, nowadays, the traditional role of a teacher to provide information and to teach particular subjects may not be so important. The students can do it themselves through books and the internet and so on and so forth. And this is a good thing. Now the teacher can actually do what anything else cannot, uh, others cannot do. That is facilitate teaching, guide teaching, support teaching, <coughs> encourage teaching. Uh, he says the grandmother technique. How does this work? How does that work? And the student is, the little boy is eager to find out and tell the teacher how this works or that works. So that is the role of the teacher. Now, we don't have much time. Maybe one, 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 one point. Let me go to um, the curriculum. Swami Vivekananda said, Western science coupled with Vedanta, well known that he wanted to combine spirituality with secular knowledge. But I'll go to something more controversial. Completely unfashionable to say this, but I'll say it in, Swamiji said it. Religion is the innermost core of education. I do not mean my own or anyone else's opinion about religion. The true eternal principles have to be held before the people. And how do we reconcile this with our modern thought in the secular education, our constitution which forbades the te teaching of religion in, in uh, educational institutions? Quickly, some thoughts. Uh, I'll go a little further ahead. Swamiji says, every improvement in India requires first of all an upheaval in religion before flooding India with socialistic or political ideas, dilute the land with spiritual ideas. We go to uh, Ramakrishna Commission, 1948 University Education Commission. It's gathering dust in the libraries, not implemented even uh, substantially. Very interesting section there. Religion in a secular state, teaching religion in a secular state. He says the intention is not to ban all religious instruction in state schools. Nowadays we will be very careful about using this word. We will use value education or spiritual education. He was very clear about it. Religious instruction in state schools. We must not be carried away by sentiment. Religion is not responsible for communalism, but the ignorance, bigotry, and selfishness with which religion is, gets mixed up. <coughs> I will add to this something that doc, the good doctor was not aware of at that time. If the state vacates its responsibility, if the state does not teach the eternal principles, the liberal principles of religion, of all religions, what will happen is interested parties, the particular religions, they will step into the vacuum and they will teach anyway. And then the children grow up with a distorted view of their own religion and other religions also. And that's one, one source of communalism. Democracy and religion. In the preamble of a constitution, we have the makings of a national faith, the election commission. A national way of life which is essentially democratic and religious. Um, Swami Ranganathan used to say, that the constitution can be taken as our new smriti. We can, uh, we can follow the highest ideals are there in our constitution and we can take it as a new smriti. It's not a clash between manusmriti and constitution. Gandhiji said in one place, he uh, was accused of doing religion in politics. He said the two greatest forces for the welfare of humanity I know are religion and politics. As long as I, see, as long as I live, I shall not cease to do politics in religion and religion in politics. Radha Krishnan Commission also says, Indian view of religion is this, religion as realization, Religion is spiritual training, religion is self-effort, freedom from inquiry in religion. It has always been a fact in our religion, freedom, full freedom of inquiry. Argumentation, vada, vada, the whole process of shastrata was a process of inquiry. A very sophisticated process. And freedom in social practices also, it could have been taken directly from Swami Vivekananda's teachings. And he has recommended, practical recommendations, Radha Krishna Commission. Silent meditation, study of great books, study of scriptures, the philosophy of religion should be taught. Example, Ekam Sab Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the Holy Quran says there is no compulsion in religion. You to your God, we to ours. Okay. Um, any more time is there? 
No, I think not. Uh, okay. We need time for discussion. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, there was one more uh, point about methodology, but if it comes up in discussion, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Method of education, concentration, but uh, that's okay. We can talk about it after, uh, uh, in, in the question answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji. That was one of the best presentations I have ever had. I am not given to <coughs> give away praise for nothing, but <coughs> indeed it was very good. I am sure there will be many questions. I have a few, but I will refrain from raising them uh, now and wait my turn. Uh, Swamiji, will you like to begin? Uh, may I say, before you begin, you know, we are already uh, just five minutes away from five o'clock. So with your permission, uh, we will uh, go up to 5.15 instead of ending at 5 o'clock, okay? I don't, don't want to monopolize this question in uh, the privilege, but uh, this presentation was so beautiful. And uh, two points I would like to, uh, uh, two observations or two points to add. That's all, not a comment. One is, we, if you study Swamiji's definitions of religion and uh, 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 education, they are similar. Education is the manifestation of the perfection already in man. Religion is the manifestation of the divinity already in man. So but how do you relate these two? Uh, just, uh, so they, they are well, they basically some same process at two levels. That is one point. The second one is you refer to Vygotsky and constructivism. In that case, the recent uh, education, there is a tremendous paradigm shift in education. And that is the understanding that every what Swamiji said, a child teaches herself by herself. The recent uh, structuralism, the structuralism is an old theory, but it has been revived and introduced into education. The idea is each uh, <coughs> child gets the interpretation, hermeneutics, those who know about uh, postmodernism, for hermeneutics is becoming an important subject. People, they found that everyone is constantly interpreting. When I, when I have seen myself with students, when you teach, once I was teaching English, our professor had gone, so I had one year I had to teach English grammar to the brahmacharians. After teaching, I asked, I saw their notes. It was dictated notes. I saw each person has done in his own way. It is not because they are hearing any defect. They are interpreting. The, each, so they have, they are, their recent idea is every child, uh, the world around, each child interprets the experiences he gets. He has got an, a, an, a, an aperceptive mass of information and uh, emotions. So whatever, when a new idea comes, he tries to relate to that what he has already got. Any experience, he relates to the experience that he already got. So this is known as structural, post-structuralism, and now in the educational field is known as constructivism. That is our, our Vygotsky was one of the chief exponents. So this has totally altered the role of the teacher. Now, teacher is known as the, is known as the enabling, enabling education. The teach, student learns himself, himself or herself. The role of the teacher is to enable the student to learn uh, her by herself. So that is known as the enabling education. Now it has changed. Facilitator to the enabling. The teacher is the one who enables. <coughs> and these two points only I want to. Uh, Maharaj, in fact, uh, Thank you. I, uh, I could uh, have mentioned. We, uh, we'll Swamiji, you know, we'll take several questions okay, together. Fine, fine. Uh, and now that we have resolved to go beyond uh, five o'clock, uh, I think I can take at least uh, three or four more questions. Professor Mukhopadhyay and you, sir, after that. Very small. It's not a question, but a very small three to two three minutes, two three words. I one is uh, about the video marriage Sorry. and what Speak with the I mic. to my Vivekananda and how he, how he replied. And In this connection, I would uh, draw your attention to the situation, what happened earlier. 
there was a controversy between Vidyasagar uh, and Vivekananda uh, and And Bhangabhyadra wrote something. And it did not, it displeased uh, Vidyasagar. And during Vidyasagar's lifetime, Bhangabhyadra never wrote anything. After the death of Vidyasagar, uh, Bhangabhyadra wrote the paper, uh, answer. He said, I did not write it because I didn't want to hurt him. But the point was this, Vidyasagar was uh, defending his position against Shastra by quoting Shastra. Bhungyabhyadra's point was, let people be educated and this practice will vanish. So this is uh, relevant, already we are uh, discussing. The other thing is very simple, that uh, manifestation, actually what Plato used to say and that following uh, Socrates, that learning is remembering. All that is there, we are now remembering and he has demonstrated it with uh, writers from geometry. The so one point which I, uh, I think we uh, uh, a little wrong perhaps, it is not idealist, those who say that mind is empty and all that the learning comes from outside. Yes, sir. Um, Swamiji, just, uh, I am not, uh, have, I don't have any questions, but I want to add one or two points sir. what we have already explained very beautifully. Now, while uh, starting about the, play, the Greek philosophy, uh, you started with the Plato, but before Plato, as Professor Mukhopadhyayji uh, rightly said, that Socrates is uh, very important, we must be very cognizant of it. His method of teaching is called, uh, it is a method of midwifery. He put a questions, question and answers. This is how he meets uh, some uh, slave boys and uh, uh, put questions and elicit answers from them. Hmm? So, Socratic uh, dialogue. Yeah, Socratic dialogue. Let's see. And another thing I want to say, you referred to Bertrand Russell. Yes. Is that really that Bertrand Russell's contribution to education is something uh, marvelous and it's innovative. Uh, Russell made a distinction, a beautiful distinction between education in knowledge and education of character. He says, and sometimes you see, education must not, not only give knowledge, but it should also impart wisdom. Sometimes it's called an education of character. So education in knowledge and education of character is a beautiful distinction that Russell made in his writings on education. Thank you. Right, other questions? Uh, just, uh, yes, Swami. Uh, no question, but I would like to say that it was a beautiful presentation yes, and the uh, only thing that we missed some very important part of it anyway. Uh, congratulations to my dear brother. Uh, I would like to just share a very interesting anecdote. I was invited to one of the very important engineering colleges for lecture. So just before going for the lecture, for a cup of tea we were discussing. Uh, because it was just suddenly made up, the, I didn't know how it was. It was, the, it was organized by somebody else. I said, I asked the principal, uh, what would you like me to speak to them? You can speak anything except religion. <laughs> because ours is a secular country and we have been advised by our management not to speak about religion. But then I told only about religion. And students, Instead of one hour, stood for one and a half hour. But I give them a scientific way of religion and give Swami just views on uh, divinity. With a, I started with the story of lion and the sheep, and students uh, were very happy. But anyway, what I'm uh, we need to say that what point he brought up about Swami Vivekan told again and again that religion is the core of education which we have forgotten and that is the mother of all the problems that we are facing today in the society with the corruption or anything. It's because we forgot the message of Swamiji and Supreme Court has very rightly pointed out that secularism does not mean that you cannot follow your religion. You have faith in your own religion, only thing that you do not have any hatred towards other religions, but we have taken in a wrong way and that is the basis of all. Uh, that is the reason of all the problems. We are right to point it out in your okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, Professor Bhatt, uh, briefly. I, I thank uh, yeah, uh, Swamiji for a wonderful presentation. I will support what he said and I will come to uh, Guru Charan Das got an invitation from a, a school actually to speak. And uh, he said, uh, I will speak on Mahabharata. Then the principal said, oh no, ours is a secular country. 
then Gurucharan Das told when Mahabharata became religious. I think we have lost, you know, this very... And uh, we invited uh, Sadhav Priyananda Ji this time to IIM. Maybe for the first time I took the bold step. One foreign student from Belgium, he was sitting uh, in front of me for the Bible. I was asking uh, how was the course lecture. He said, everything fine, but you brought a monk. I said, what is the problem? He said, no, in our country, uh, ethics and religion, they are different, uh, poles apart. But he corrected, but now I understood from the Indian students, in India it is accepted. I said, that is the thing. What Swami Vivekananda told long back, you can't do without religion in India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Well, uh, if there is none, then I would like to put one question to you, uh, Swamiji, which is this. Uh, since I am a historian by profession, uh, I have been very curious, uh, been thinking of this, uh, what led in his own life experience or his historical situation, what led to the development of these ideas in the mind of Swami Vivekananda? You know, unless, of course, we, 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 we resort to some divine explanation that, you know, such ideas came to him from, from some divine being or uh, from uh, If we are attempting to make uh, any kind of explanation that is acceptable in our everyday reason, reasoning, what do you think in his own life experience uh, which led to the uh, development of these somewhat original ideas. Is there any other question? No, I just thought... Oh, yes, I'm sorry, sir. Yes, please. Uh, Briefly, huh? What Maharaj has said, education for spirituality. What I do understand is that true education to true spirituality. Because the education to spirituality, straight away, if we see the present day education to spirituality, there's a gap, I feel. But true education to true spirituality is the, in bracket, it is there that what I issue, if it is correct or not. Yes, uh, I'll start with the last question first, uh, Professor Bhattacharya's question. Sources for Vivekananda's ideas. First of all, his own education, which was a mix of traditional Indian education, learning Sanskrit and all that at home, um, Persian also to some extent from his father. And the Western education which he got from uh, the school and from Scottish Church, and it is a very liberal kind of uh, English Western education, British. Then the three sources which Nivedita mentions, the three central sources. First is his Guru, Sri Ramakrishna So the kind of uh, transforming, uh, transferring of India's spiritual wisdom in a homespun, very uh, very direct way, which he got from at the feet of Sri Ramakrishna. Number one. Number two. Uh, the spiritual traditions of India which he got from study of Vedanta and his own spiritual experiences. And third would be uh, India itself which he had a first hand experience when he wandered all over India before going to the West, meeting uh, various classes of people and seeing the problems at first hand. So these are I think the main sources of Vivekananda as we know. And then I will go to Premier uh, Bhajananji Maharaj's comments. In fact, it's very pertinent what he has pointed out. The whole idea of teacher as a facilitator or enabler can function only when you accept constructivism as uh, the, the setting for education. It will not function in a traditional setup, a classroom setup. It's only constructivism as uh, expounded by uh, Piaget and later by, uh, or simultaneously in fact, but independently by Vygotsky. Um, so that is that is very right and uh, that is very well pointed out. In fact, Swami Vivekananda's idea of learning as manifestation comes is, is actually very close to constructivism. And constructivism uh, does not come, in fact, from construction. It comes from the word construe to make an understanding of the world and con constantly change that. I'm construing the world in this way. Interpreting. It's a, it's a process of interpretation and all of us are doing that in children in the classroom and everywhere. They are continuously doing that. And the teacher has to be aware of this. It's not uh, like a computer where you put some program and the computer will respond exactly like that. Then uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay, sir, you spoke about the context of the comment by Swami Vivekananda about widow remarriage. Here I would like to just point out a few years back, 
Tonika Sharka uh, from JNU, I think. Shumit Sharka. She came to Vidya Mandir and she gave a talk about this issue. And she really opened my eyes. I had, I had always read Swami Vivekananda's comment that, am I a widow? Why are you asking me that? Give education, they will solve their own problems. Tonika Sharka, she pointed out that there were two parties to this controversy. One group of traditional pundits who opposed it because it's against dharma and against the smritis. One group of uh, progressive people uh, like Vidya Shagar who supported it. Whether uh, they, he said that they should marry, they should be allowed to remarry. And the other group said they should not be allowed to remarry, they should remain with their in-laws or go back to their parents. Now, Tony Kasharka says, both groups are entirely composed of men. <laughs> Nobody asked the widows themselves, what is your view? And it seems logical, but there are only two views. Either you allow it or you don't allow it. But then she quotes from a learned lady who wrote at that time, a widow herself who wrote in a magazine at that time. That means when I look upon the debate raging over my status, whether I should be allowed to marry or not, I am disappointed because I neither want to remain with under the uh, control of my brothers in my parents' house, nor do I want to marry and remain under the control of another man. What I want is education and the right to be as free and to decide my future like any man. This is what Swamiji saw very directly. This is a remarkable insight, uh, which is not, which seems to be very clear to women and not at all clear to men until it is pointed out to them. And but Bhumi Prasad said exactly that. Exactly. And before that, she came to me. And uh, then Professor Prasad, he points out uh, Russell's contribution. Absolutely, sir, definitely Russell's point of view. And uh, Maharaj, I just take that up. Uh, then the last thing I'll just point to about secularism. We pointed out we have all been discussing about this. I think that there is a confusion about the two meanings of secularism. Ashish Nandi, Professor Ashish Nandi, pointed this out in a wonderful article where he says secularism has two meanings. If you literally look at the dictionary meaning, secular means not religion, no religion. Secular literally means uh, religion, ex exclusion of religion. And it comes from the Western context, separation of church and state. In Indian context, it's a new meaning, it's a valid meaning. We immediately translate secularism into Indian languages if you ask anybody, Bengali, Hindi, Oriya, Dharma, Nirapeksha. Neutral as regards religion. Same kind of treatment to all religions. But this is not the meaning of sec original meaning of secularism. And when we confuse these two meanings, then comes the problem that if you want to talk about a text which may have religious overtones, immediately you say, no, it's not allowed because we are secular. Now you are in interpreting in the first meaning. That is not Dharma Nirapeko, that is Adharma, without Dharma actually. So uh, this is just a point, how there are two meanings of secularism. And uh, we make a mistake, sort of category mistake in analytic language. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's about all. Uh, once again, I would like to thank the both the speakers. And uh, uh, I think that's that brings us to the end of the day. Is that right? So we meet tomorrow at uh, is it 9.30?